Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session. Um, today, we're going to be talking about easily connect applications across clouds with uh, Service Interconnect. Um, and here with you, it's uh, Bamsi. Bamsi is the principal technical marketing engineer on Red Hat. So, Bamsi, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Bamsi, doing technical marketing uh, at Red Hat, focusing on application foundations and Service Interconnect. Nice, perfect. And I'm also part of the uh, developer team uh, advocate as part of the uh, application services BU. So we want to welcome you to this session. We hope you're enjoying the rest of the sessions. You enjoy the keynote and perhaps you're participating in the labs. So keep with us. There's going to be a lot of content still uh, during the day. So let's get started with this session. Okay, um, we're gonna go over uh, some slides at the beginning and then we want to show you a demo. So remember that you can do any uh, Q&A session and um, sorry, questions uh, on the QA area that is in the top side of the uh, top right side of your of your window. Or you can just do, you know, write something on the chat. Uh, we are gonna be uh, able to monitor that. So uh, we uh, when we talk about um, the challenges on application connectivity, and perhaps you uh, heard before Mark talking about the uh, some of these kind of connectivity patterns, it's that um, every single day we are um, adding more and more components and more and more sites to our architecture. So we are doing um, distributed applications, and we are moving away from the traditional single mainframe, single data center into uh, multiple applications. So we are relying on different environments where we are distributing our applications. And those environments are really uh, uh, very diverse. They're not homogeneous and they are um, very different um, between each other. Uh, perhaps you are still using, you know, legacy systems, old Unix systems, mainframes and such. Um, or perhaps you are using already some virtualization, bare metal perhaps, but every single VM that you're using, it's different on, on its own. Or you have already, you know, started using some Kubernetes software um, that can be different between of the providers that are uh, uh, giving you access to those. Or if you decide to standardize on top of uh, Red Hat OpenShift, it could be that even you are uh, handling multiple versions of OpenShift and multiple clusters of OpenShift. Perhaps you start with OpenShift 3 and now you're OpenShift 4, perhaps moving into a managed service like Arrow or Rosa that are our offerings on top of Azure and uh, Red Hat OpenShift. So, this uh, brings us to the challenge of the hybrid cloud and the distributed uh, applications across different clouds. Um, we, uh, at the beginning of this cloud journey, thought that perhaps we just will need one single cloud to be able to fulfill all our requirements uh, for up distributed applications. However, what we realized at the end was that that worked for certain kind of business that were able to do, you know, cloud native applications and such, but for more traditional um, uh, um, organizations and industries and for those that require, you know, heavy compliance with uh, regulations and laws and, and things like that, uh, we realized that going to one single provider would, was perhaps not the, uh, the, uh, the solution that we were looking for because we had uh, different challenges, right? From compliance security, we cannot, you know, take data out of the country or out of the region. We need to be um, uh, compliant with certain uh, information that is available on the uh, on, on a specific region. Perhaps there's not even a, a, a region of the decided provider in our country, so we cannot comply with that. Or data that is being generated and stored in, the, um, in, in that specific cloud uh, that we have been chosen, it's, it's uh, just... Um, uh, keeping growing and growing and perhaps moving that data, it's it's not uh, easy enough. So that data gravity, um, but also you want to be looking for the better solution. So you know that certain cloud provider has great AI API, so you want to use them. Other has a very good storage system and, and storage APIs and services. So you want to get the best of that. So at the end, what you end, it's with this connectivity challenge because you will need to uh, handle all those different um, uh different environments, different clouds, different your own data center. And, and the problem is that not all of them are public and not all of them are going to be totally open for you to connect to. So that's where you have two main challenges. So the, the first one on the left is the hybrid cloud connectivity. You already have your own data center, your own private cloud, and you want to connect to the public cloud where you get you know more services, you get scalability, and so on. So most of the times, 
you won't be opening, you know, uh, ports on your private cloud or just adding uh, firewall rules to be uh, to allow people to enter. So how do you solve the challenge? The other one is when you need to connect sites like branch offices or locations that are uh, spread across multiple multiple regions, multiple uh, physical locations, and you want to use some way to connect and 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 being able to access. Uh, from one edge site to another to check inventory from one of your stores into all the different stores in the region or in the area that are available, but perhaps to offer a better experience for your customers. So this is the kind of edge-to-edge -edge connectivity that we are looking for. And to solve these different challenges, there are multiple options. Um, and the one that we're going to present uh, today, it's just one of different options. Um, we think it's, it's, uh, it's a simpler and better approach for um, for some of the users because of, uh, of the things that um, Bamsi and me were going to be showing later. But there are options and choices. You do public IP networks. You can just open the firewall, uh, poke holes into that, and expose certain uh, services directly. Um, you can use uh, things like uh, NAT services, IPS, and, and such. Or um, you can create your own VPN network, right? You can set up software to be able to, you know, um, uh, extend your uh, different networks into different sites and being able to have this uh, kind of uh, IP tables that are routing different network segments and such. Um, or you can go with a, a cloud provider and use things like a, a, a VPC for uh, network isolation. Um, the problem is that us mostly dependent on the on the cloud provider. What, what if I want to mix providers? How do I merge and, and, and attach to those uh, networks? when I'm using a different cloud vendor, and um, also obviously the cost related to that. And the uh, proposal that we had, it's related to uh, the overlay network or the service network, where uh, the solution uh, that Red Hat offers called Service Interconnect will um, certainly focus on. So let's get into the details of the first challenge. I want to work on the hybrid cloud. So, um, I myself, I'm part of the uh, team and the IT team that is uh, managing the old data center, the bastion, the Ford, where everything is running. And we have a simple application here. It's just a simplification, but it could be a more complex system where I do have a database, perhaps something, you know, like um, a DB2 database or an Oracle database, or perhaps even a rack system that it's, you know, running on my own data center that I most of the times won't be taken to the cloud because of the data gravity that we mentioned. But also I have a UI that allows me to, you know, um, handle the information of my patients. And then I have a payment processor for patients to be able to pay for their own, um, for their own bills. As you can imagine, we want to, you know, move our UI that it's not, uh, that does not require, you know, PII compliance um, uh, uh, challenges or things like that into the cloud. And we're going to be using the cloud provider, call it public cloud number one or AWS. And then we want to move that uh, UI over there. However, if you can imagine if my UI first was accessing the database directly using, you know, a, a JDBC connection or a TCP socket and my um, uh, payment processor API, if I want to expose that service externally to be able to access, I will need to implement things like an API gateway to be able to control, to control the access to my service, to have a single point of entry, to have security, some policies and such. But when I implement an API gateway that is mainly focused on HTTP, suddenly I've realized that if I want to access the database, I will need to uh, do something like an uh, intermediate um, system or service that will expose REST to database and database to REST, so I'm able to query the information there. So that means a lot of pulling parts, a lot of development that I will need to try, test, and deploy to be able to fulfill this challenge. But that's not what I want. What I really want is that I want to continue using my application, my UI, connecting directly using the TCP socket, the JDBC connection to my database as well as my data center. You know, remember as we were, um, working at the beginning where everything was on the data center, where like everything was local. So that's what I want to do. So how can Service Connect in, uh, help us to do that? Well, this is what we were going to see. What we want to do really is to first be able to merge and get connectivity between 
uh, those uh, two sites, right? From my data center to my public cloud one. But as you can imagine, we don't want to open, you know, ports on my data center. So what I will be doing is I will establish a connection from my uh, more secure data center to my public cloud where I can expose or and already have these low balancers, this API gateway, because they're going to be part of my UI access and, 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 and infrastructure. So I will establish a connection using Service Interconnect to be able to connect first my clouds, and then I will be able to expose the services. So we can do this in a very simple four easy steps. So step number one, we just need to have our clouds and then being able to initialize using the Scupper CLI, um, that is basically the service in connect CLI that we're gonna be using in both sites. So what it will be do, it will start the um, data plane and the control plane on each one of the, uh, of the sites to be able to uh, deploy our uh, routers. The routers are going to be are going to be the ones that are going to uh, fulfill the proxy kind of uh, of uh, of a job between my connections. So the second thing is create this token. The token is basically the credentials that I'm going to be using for my uh, private cluster to be able to connect to my public cluster. So basically, we are going to be sharing that information, those credentials through this token. That in, at the end, it's just a mutual TLS connection where I'm going to validate the certificates of the connection. In the second one, we're gonna then establish the link and that link will use those credentials to, to connect both uh, services in a bi-directional uh, channel, but using just one single connection. So then the next step is just expose my service to the network so I'm able to then um, connect to this um, overlay network, service network, and have some services being exposed and shared across the uh, service. So I can expose service A in the public cluster as well as uh, service B in the private cluster and both of them will be available for anyone to be able to consume that. And then finally, we want to show you how to do this. And for that, we have BAMSI that has already set up this kind of environment and we'll be sharing that to you. So BAMSI. Thanks, thanks Hugo. Oh. I hope, uh, can, you, can you see my screen and uh, when I switch between the terminals? Yeah, I can see it, so all good. Anyway, so so the the setup here is we have three two, two different uh, we have uh, we have one uh, we have this is our AWS cloud where we we have deployed OpenShift and we have deployed our front end here. If I do OC get pods, you can see that we have deployed the front end here, and this is how our patient front end portal currently looks. Currently, it's empty. You can't see any patient values, doctor values. And uh, the goal is for us to go ahead and, uh, you know, make a connection between this data center and AWS cloud so that the UI can access both the, uh, you know, the database and the payment processor, right? So it's, this is what we want to do. Though they are residing in different clouds and different environments, we want to make it seem like they're all part of a single uh you know a single domain and not not different networks or different clouds and let's see how service interconnect enables us to do that right so this is our aws cloud as hugo mentioned these are the steps that i'm going to do first first let's uh, initialize you know service interconnect using the scupper cli on one site i'm enabling it on our aws site this will establish the routers um in the aws r like we'd like to call cloud one one thing i'd like to remember i forgot to mention is that uh, you know uh, i have different color denotions for different environments so the green color is for the aws cloud the the blue color is for the azure cloud which we'll talk about later and the red uh, the orange is for the data center so when i'm switching between the different clis you know which environment i'm applying these commands on so i've initialized my uh, scupper on aws and then now I'm going back to my, uh, you know, the my data center to initialize the router, the service interconnect routers there. And good. So another thing to remember here is, you know, I'm already running both my containers, the the database and uh, the payment processor in my data center, as the image shows here. So basically, what we are doing is. We are just moving, we've just moved the UI to the AWS cloud, and now we are trying to establish the, the connectivity, right? 
So let's let's we initialize copper. Now what next? As uh, as you've seen in the diagrams that Hugo showed you, now we have to create a token that will that will exchange that will create in the AWS cloud and then send it to the data center to create this uh, you know mutual TLS based connection between both these sites. So let me go ahead and create the token here. I'm going and creating the token. And uh, give it a minute. Let me see. Generate this token. Okay, I have the token here. This is the token, as you can see. This is very important for establishing the mutual TLS. I will go ahead and copy that token into my data center where both my database and payment processor are, are running. Let me copy it. Need to be very. There's better ways to transfer the token, but I'm I'm going to make take the simpler route here. I'm going to save the token. So now what I'll do is using this token, I'm going to create establish a link between both the sites by issuing the scupper link command, and I'm also giving a name to this uh, link or uh, link between these two sites, saying AWS to EM, right? And uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, create that link. And it says site configure to the link, and it shows the, the Kubernetes cluster that it has established the connection with. Now, what happened is we've established the connection. Sorry, we've established the connection between uh, we've established the connection between both these sites, but uh, none of my front end or my uh, my front end doesn't know what services are exposed. So we have to explicitly say to uh, uh, to the network that only these services that I'm going to expose will be available for the front end to consume. So let's go ahead and check. I, I, let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to do the scupper expose for both database and the payment processor to for them to be available on the network. Let me go ahead and hit. Okay, there's something wrong. As usual happens with demos, but let me let me try this again. Service database already defined. Okay. Okay. There was, I typed host twice here. There was a typo in the command. Let me go ahead and expose my payment processor. That should work. Yeah. So now what I've essentially done is I've, I've told my data center, the scupper network in my data center to expose both the payment processor and the database to the network. But at the same time, we have to create uh, you know, services that map to both uh, both these services in my AWS cloud too. So it's it's the router will call this service the local service, and the local service in turn will route to the services that they find on the network. So we'll create the services with the same names. And as soon as you are done with that, if everything works well as we are expecting, if you go back, as soon as I refresh you should see that patient values are coming. So essentially what we have done here is, you know, we've established this connectivity and we've exposed both these over a network and the UI is actually accessing both the database and the payment processor as if they are on the same network. And, uh, you know, it's we are not building any REST to DB conversion and, and all that complex stuff, right? It all behaves like a single network, even though you've moved uh, to different environments. Let's also go check if the payment is working because we exposed two services here. Uh, that should work. Yeah, some, I've been having a little bit of caching issues. So let me just uh, try to pin down this part and take it up because I've been having a little bit of caching issues with my browser, but uh, uh, let me try that now. Is the part up. Give it a minute while it loads up. Let's try to go back. Yeah, let's try to access our patient here. Wills, no wills. Martin. Wills. 
Yeah, see, so so what is technically happening is once I go ahead and make the payment, it is calling the payment service. And the way we know the payment pro payment is success is, you know, the date paid and the processor ID will will show up. So if it's if it's only a numbers, that means it's coming from the database in the later demos. What we'll see is we'll move the payment processor to another cloud and, and see how how we can create that connection and what what is the significance of doing that. So. So what we've done here is we basically connected our services across different environments, uh, uh, you know, across a real data center, co different Kubernetes clusters, and uh, also legacy clusters. So basically, that's what Service Interconnect provides, right? It it helps you link different applications and services across different environments in three to four simple steps by you know exchanging the tokens and exposing the services. Now let's talk about portability across uh, the the clouds, right? I have, as you know, we've deployed the payment payment uh, processor here. Let me just be mindful of time here. Yeah, good. So as you know, we've established the payment processor here. And uh, we are also at the same time, we want to we want to move the payment processor to another new cloud because of some regulatory issues or also uh, some, some kind of regulatory issues, for example, right? And uh, and, and let's see how we can do that without losing connectivity or without having any downtime, right? So currently we have a payment processor. The payment processor, as you can see, gives gives us a number, which me, if, if it just gives us a number, this is the ID of the processor. That means it is coming from the data center. But if it comes from the Azure cloud, the, if the payment process, if, if our UI will use the payment processor that is in the Azure cloud, you will get, you should ideally get that, you know, the payment happened at Azure or some message like that, right? So let's let's see how to do that. So what I'll try to do is now first, I will try to establish a link between my AWS cloud and Azure cloud. So again, what we have to do is we have to go ahead and, uh, you know, create a token as we usually do, going ahead and, uh, creating a token. This, this is the token I'll try to establish the connection between AWS and uh, my Azure cloud. Right, and uh, let's go to our Azure cloud. Azure cloud is a, is a blue color terminal. We've already deployed our uh, payment processor here. As you can see, I've already deployed my payment processor. So what I'll do now is I'll initialize Copper here. Let's wait for a minute while Scupper initializes. And now I will use that secret that I created uh, on the AWS cluster to create the link between Azure and AWS. So what I'm technically doing is I am, uh, let me pick a pointer here. So basically I am establishing this link here, right? So let's let's see how, how that goes. Uh, I'm going to create the link. Okay, that is some nomenclature, but that's fine. Should not have any capitals, AWS to Azure, that's okay. This should be okay now. There you go. So we've established the, this link that we've been talking about, but we also need to expose the payment processor that is in the Azure cloud over the Scupper network. How do we do that? We just ex issue the Scupper expose command and uh, Yeah, it's been exposed. So now, now what next? What next, right? So currently, this is this is our state, and uh, let's what this we we've established connection between the Azure cloud, the the AWS cloud, and the Rel data center. Now let's let's try to take out the payment processor in our data center and see if it if it goes back to the Azure cloud. This way, you know, when you have two different instances of the same payment processor. If one payment processor goes down, or if you want to, you know, migrate to the cloud, or if one payment processor goes down in 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 cases of high availability or failovers, the Azure cloud will take over because it is a part of the same network and has the same service name. So let's see how we do that. So first, I will go ahead and, you know, 
unexpose or uh, remove the payment processor from the network, which is located in the data center using the scupper unex unexpose command. Uh, let's do that. It looks good. It looks good. Okay. So ideally, what we've done is I've, I've removed the payment processor from here. And let's see if that works, right? Let's let's try for another patient. So ideally, because we don't have we don't have the payment processor in the in the data center, the, the processor should show that uh, you know the payment has gone and uh, through the Azure cluster because that's where the other instance of the payment uh, processor is located. So there you go. See, before it was showing as a number. Now, because we uh, that number was coming from the data center now since we've killed the payment processor in the data center and only kept the uh, you know the payment processor in the azure emulating a scenario where for example say if the payment processor in the data center goes down would it default to azure that's happening here you see here so now you see one angela martin who's the patient her payment was processed in from the data center the number shows that it's coming from the data center but as soon as her payment went and the, the the payment processor in the Dell data center went down, the Azure the payment service in the Azure took over, and uh, you know the other patient Dwight could use the Azure cluster without them knowing the UI the UI just called the uh, the payment processor at Azure to process this payment. So that's 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 uh, that's another use case where uh, uh, Scupper is super helpful providing you know fault high availability and uh, you know uh, support for failovers now the next the next use case that we'll see is i i'm just being mindful of time here yeah i think we have more time the next use case that we'll see here is you know cloud connectivity resilience what that means is you know we've established connections between so for example if you say Scupper also enables indirect connections. What I mean by that is, for example, if you are connected from, say, uh, so legacy to, if you don't have a direct connection between two sites, if you have an indirect path, uh, and if the direct connection goes down, uh, the Scupper network finds a way to reach to the service to the through the indirect paths. So, for a, through our example, if I had to, if I have to explain that. Uh, so if I have to explain that in our example, right, for example, if the direct connection between, uh, you know, the Azure and AWS cloud goes down where the payment processor is sitting, the, what, what Scupper does is it says, okay, the AWS cloud is connected to the rel data center and the rel data center is connected to the Azure cloud. So even though there is no direct connection, but since all of these are part of the same Scupper network. Uh, let me find, let me see, uh, Scupper will uh, route the request through, sorry, Scupper will route the request through this uh, indirect path, uh, through this indirect path. So let's see how, how that happens, right? So before that, let's establish a connection between the data center and the Azure cloud, which we've missed doing, right? So let's, let's go back to our terminal here and let's do that. Let's First, create a token in our Azure Cloud. This is Azure Cloud, the blue color one. Let me open that. Okay, this is the token. Let's go to our uh, data center. data center and copy, right? Let's copy the token. And let's try, let's create the link. So now what we are doing is we are, we are, we are essentially create a, creating a link between, uh, you know, the Azure, uh, Azure Cloud and our data center. 
that's the first step yes we've created that so what we've done is we've established this link here and now what i'll do is i will take down this link between aws and azure so how do i how, and and by default scupper will find this route and it should route through the alternative path so let's let's uh, take down the link between uh, aws and azure let's go to our azure cluster uh, and let me just clear these commands so that you see it better let's go to our azure cluster and uh, let's uh, say scupper delete link let's see scupper link status i'm doing this to get the link name of the link here Okay, so it's AWS to Azure, so Scupper. So we see the, the link AWS to Azure is still connected. I'm going to go ahead and delete that link. Scupper link delete AWS to Azure, right? Has been removed when you do Scupper link status. You don't find it. So what I've done here is I've taken down the direct link between this. But there is an indirect link from AWS to data center and data center to Azure Cloud. So even though these are not directly connected, the payment should still go through. Let's see if our payment works. Let's try for another patient, right? Let's say Kevin Malone. Pay. Submit payment and payment processed at Azure. So what, what we are essentially seeing here is, you know, even though there is no direct connection, Scupper is is establishing that connection by finding some indirect routes so that you know it supports high availability not just for the services like we've seen in the previous case but this is high availability for the connections itself so so we've seen um, three different use cases right here just to sum up one is plain connections when we move i'm going back here a little bit but one is one is just establishing the connections and uh, think uh, uh, making it feel like they're a part of the same network. That's the first use case that we've seen. The second use case that we've seen is, you know, having the payment processor at two different sites and uh, providing high availability that way. And what if the payment processor goes down in one site, say the data center, the other site, the other, other payments, other, the payment processor in the other center will take over. And the last use case that we've seen is the high availability for the connection itself, which means if one connection goes down, Service Interconnect finds alternative paths through indirect connections and uh, make sure that you know the calls from the UI reach the uh, you know the payment processor if there is some means to indirect connectivity. So with that, I think that's the end of the demo. I would pass on to Hugo uh, for the next bunch of slides. Thank you, Bamsi. That was a great, great demo where we have seen a couple of scenarios that. Service Connect can help you out with. Um, interesting point that uh, Mavs was remarking is that you have two different kinds of, uh, of uh, resilience. The resilience between the services, that means that the payment processor can be in two different clouds and your UI can connect to either one of those, um, doing a load balancing, perhaps a round robin kind of access, or based on you know which service it's closer to. So you can manage things like cost and see which one has la less latency and being able to process that first. But if that service it's too much, um, it's too, under too much stress, you can do overflow and then move to the different one. Um, and if one fails, you automatically get re rerouted to, to the other one. And then the second kind of a scenario for high availability is between the links, between the, your cloud connectivity. Say you lose the load balancer, you lose the connection between those sites, but you still get this, the access through your data center. So because you still have uh, established MPLS networks between uh, your data center and those clouds, you can still be able to reroute through those services um, using uh, using uh, service interconnect. So that's pretty interesting. Now, making a recap of the, of, of the service interconnect, this is application focus kind of, uh, of creation. That means that it's layer seven addressing. So we just create links and name them using addresses that become uh, available for service discovery using the Kubernetes uh, DNS, as well as the uh, Podman site that we were showing uh, running on the 
data center. So that means that we are able to create this abstraction layer uh, on top of your current uh, topologies and your actual cloud deployment uh, 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 networking. And you as a developer, you as an architect thinking about how you're gonna design and create your applications, mm -hmm. you can think about this single application domain. It doesn't matter where your applications are living, because one of the things that we see when people talk about multi-cloud is that they have um, just the same service across, uh, 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 duplicated in different clouds and different uh, uh, regions and such. But when we think about distributed applications, is that you have the service in the place where it should belong, and your applications are still able to consume and, and, and access those, those services. And finally, one of the remarks that we mentioned uh, at the beginning, but we want to show is that Every single connection, it's uh, it's working using uh, mutual TLS. So you have a shared trust network between the connections, mm -hmm. uh, between between the sites, between the clouds. Mm -hmm. uh, but your um, services and your applications are using uh, the uh, standard protocol that they were using before. So one of the things that we didn't show is that we are using a traditional um, Postgres database for this demo. That it's exposing just you know the the, the Postgre protocol on, on the port 5432, but it's not using TLS. And we are spreading our application or UI into the uh, into other clouds with the payment processor, but we are not adding TLS to those services. Those services require no changes, no additional sidecars, no things uh, related to be able to have this kind of connectivity. And the other thing around that we mentioned is that we were using user scope. Uh, um, um, uh, access to these clusters. We don't need to be admins to be able to create these clusters and this configuration. Um, as Bamsi was mentioning, the clouds where he was deploying, he was just a regular OpenShift user. He was not really a, a cluster admin for creating this, uh, this networking. Now, the magic behind, we can see in the next uh, slide, is that we are using uh, this uh, concept of, power of uh, open source, where we have projects that are very well established in the community, like the Apache Cupid community, where the Apache Cupid dispatch router allows us to create these, uh, these connections and establish these uh, messaging patterns across uh, one networks, where we can uh, then uh, send information across these, uh, these links. Uh, it is a very well established project since 2014. Um, there's uh, plenty of activity over there. And then we have the other new project that is called Scopper. It's the upstream community for servicing connect, interconnect. That is the one that is doing the controller of these uh, of these routers. Uh, thinking about the control plane, distributed control plane, where um, helps us to better and configure the QP dispatch router to be able to establish this as well as create some um, some pro some uh, protocol translator between MQP and HTTP as well as TCP. This is a more recent project. We're still very active, and um, uh, it, it has been a couple of years being boiling, uh, cooking, and then available now as service interconnect. Where you can see there's plenty of activity work going here. Very, very good uh, releases on the uh, on the interconnect side and the router side, as well as the control plane. Where you, as you have seen, we can run this kind of configuration as a Docker Podman running on a, on, on a local um, environment that is perhaps a VM or, or a Linux machine, you can run it on OpenShift. Uh, this is going to be also supported in other Kubernetes distributions if you want to start moving out your services that are perhaps um, And as we were mentioning, finally, the benefits, no code changes. So the same application that was running on the data center now it runs spread across the cloud, no network changes. So the only thing is that there needs to be uh, built-in uh, connectivity uh, at, layer, at, at the underlying layers to be able to expose this as the, uh, at the layer seven. No cluster admin requirements, so really good. Some of the, um, of the final um, capabilities that, that service interconnects is going to be exposing is things like, like a console. Um, so we didn't show it, uh, but a console allows you to have a, a better view of the of your network or the different services, the different um, um, uh, sites that are being connected, and the different um, traffic that is flowing through your service network. So you can see how much traffic each one of the services, which, which one of the sites are receiving. So uh, very good information for network admins or for in general, uh, the, um, the service network supervisors. And finally, uh, we are using mostly the CLI command, but there's also 
a, um, a Red Hat operator for the service internet that allows you to do a more GitOps approach using custom resources, uh, as well as uh, config maps. Well, not custom resources, but config maps for the operator to be able to um, to create and uh, and configure sites, um, being able to establish the connections and so on. Um, so there's plenty of, of stuff here to, to see, to follow up. There are uh, very good scenarios. Um, you can try it yourself. So finally, if you uh, want to reproduce this demo, um, you can go one uh, before that. Uh, we can invite you to use the uh, developer sandbox uh, under the developers.redhat.com site, uh, where you can get access to a free Kubernetes cluster. Uh, uh, well, not cluster itself, but Kubernetes namespace, where you can uh, try with that cluster to be able to reproduce these kind of demos. Uh, so Bamsi has a very good um, example that you can follow up. So um, being able to um, follow some instructions, run a Docker machine in your in your own laptop or a Podman, a Podman site, being able to uh, deploy that on, on your machine and then being able to connect and see how you can expose your local laptop services into the cloud uh, using uh, the Scopper um, uh, gateway services and so on. So still, if you just want to play with OpenShift, the developer sandbox is great, a great way to go and, uh, and enjoy. Uh, Bamsi, I think we are at the end of the session. So if you want to share some closing remarks, yeah, we can if, if the, we can we can open for questions. But if there are no uh, questions, I'd like to add one more final part, right? Uh, that we've not talked about uh, the, the ephemeral nature of the Scupper networks, right? If you if you think that you know this network that you created with Scupper is is not needed anymore, or it was created it was created by somebody who doesn't need the access anymore, all you have to go ahead and do is Scupper delete, and it will tear down all the configurations that that you've done and all the accesses are revoked so that's something i i i just thought i'll show but you just go to all the different sites do scupper delete and all the configurations are torn down there is no nothing left over and uh, you're all good there so yeah that's that's just one more thing i wanted to add but uh, if there are any questions uh, we are open for that if uh, there are no questions uh, i hope you guys uh, enjoyed the session Yes, again, uh, thank you very much for staying with us for this session. There's going to be more sessions still around. So um, uh, get there, um, see the different stages, and see the different sessions, join the labs. And we hope that you continue to enjoy the uh, rest of the event. So thank you, everyone, and see you later.